University of Manchester. Thank you. Um, who has interest in operating systems, virtual machines, hypervisors with properties like security, performance, uh, and energy efficiency? We met at the Cherry Tech workshop a few weeks ago in Glasgow, and we thought it would be a good idea to uh, invite Pierre to give a, a talk. And this is a very online talk, although I suppose hybrid, uh, because we're all here together. So, um, yeah, do you want to take it away? Yes, Rob, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for um, uh, inviting me to, to, to give this talk. Uh, so so I'm, I'm a lecturer at Manchester and my, uh, my, my domain of research is system software. So as Rob said, operating systems, hypervisors. Uh, and, and in this talk, I would like to uh, talk about two contributions in, in the domain of custom and specialized operating systems. Uh, regarding compatibility as well as security. Um, so this is the outline. Um, so so a, a particular type of operating systems I'm very interested in uh, is uh, unikernels. So I'll give a, 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 a small overview of unikernels because it's useful to understand the rest of the talk. Um, uh, and, and then I, I present two custom operating systems that, uh, that we have built. Uh, one that is focused towards uh, being compatible with legacy applications, and, and the other one that is um, uh, that aims to specialize for for security. So uh, let's get that started with uh, what unikernels are, and I have this um, kind of introductory example that I would like to that I usually uh, use, um, in which uh, so, so so let's assume that you want to. Uh, run uh, a website uh, and you don't want to run it on your own computer because you don't have them running 24 seven. So you, you want to run your website in the cloud. Uh, so what you will do is to, you will rent a full-fledged virtual machine at a cloud provider, say AWS. Um, and uh, this virtual machine is running on top of the hardware, um, uh, you know, at the cloud provider, and the hardware is multiplexed between different virtual machines by an hypervisor, so like Xen or KVM. And and within your uh, virtual machine, you have a Linux distribution like Ubuntu, which contains a bunch of user space software like libraries and so on. Uh, as well as a, a, a guest operating system, uh, say Linux. Uh, so to run the web server, you're going to install the web server software in, in the Linux distribution, say Apache. And Apache has a bunch of dependencies, you know, something like libssl to do encryption, maybe Perl or things like that. So you have a bunch of uh, dependencies, the application. And obviously, at runtime, you know, this uh, Apache is going to make use of a subset of the services provided by the Linux kernel to do things like networking, right? Uh, now, on, on this, uh, this is a very, very typical uh, cloud deployment uh, scenario, right? And um, what one observation here is that you, you just want to run a single application, which is a web server, and you end up running an having a, a lot of uh, software that is absolutely not useful for this uh, application, right? So, so we create software blocks. And um, if you look at the Linux distribution, you have a lot of library installed, a lot of demons running in the background, a lot of stuff that is absolutely not ne needed for, uh, for Apache. Um, and, and further, if you, if you look at the operating system, uh, you know, Linux is a very big monolithic piece of software and Apache is only using a very small subset of the services provided by, uh, by Linux. Huh? So uh, all, all of this software that is installed or even running, but uh, not really useful, we call it software bloat. And as you can understand, it is a problem, right? Uh, because uh, it, it is a problem in terms of security. You know, the more software you run, the more chances you have of uh, having vulnerabilities that can potentially be exploited. Um, 
So so flare of bloat leads to an increased attack surface. Um, obviously, uh, it means you are paying uh, for CPU cycles and memory and disk consumption that you actually don't uh, entirely need. So you have a, a loss of money and of course performance loss, right? This, uh, this memory and CPU cycles that are running all these demons and software that is not needed, it may be uh, better allocated to, to the application that you want to run. So uh, one solution to this problem is to uh, use what, what's called a unique kernel. Uh, a unique kernel is you take your application, uh, just the software dependencies of your application, and you compile all of that with a very small operating system layer. Think about something very close to a, an embedded operating system that contains only what your application needs. And this is all compiled into a static binary that is very similar to a kernel. So you can run it as a virtual machine on top of an hypervisor. And you get a lot of, uh, you, you, it reduces significantly the, the software bloat. So um, the, the unique kernels whose definition is you take the application, its dependencies, and a small operating system, a library operating system, you compile all of that together uh, into a static binary uh, that can run on top of a hypervisor. So you have the seminal paper uh, uh, below. Um, so unikernels are um, single purpose. So each instance of a unikernel will run only one application. Um, so what it also means is that you have one instance of the kernel per application. This is a library operating system model for those that know the, uh, the, the kernel uh, proposal from the 90s. Uh, and, and if you want to run multiple applications, you, then you know you run multiple uh, instances, multiple, multiple unikernels. Um, so further, the unikernel is a, one unikernel is single process. Um, so each uh, unikernel virtual machine contains a single address space that is shared between the kernel and the application. And uh, there is no such thing as multiple page table or uh, page table switches or thing, things like that. So once again, if you want to run a multi-process application, you can run multiple unikernels. Uh, it, uh, it has been done. Um, however, uh, if you want to have something like multi-threading, you know, leveraging multiple cores with multi multiple execution flow, sharing a, a single address space, uh, this is supported by multiple unikernel models. We have a single unikernel instance overlapping multiple virtual CPUs uh, with different threads running on uh, each uh, virtual CPU. So this has been done. Um, so one unikernel is a single binary. And uh, as I was saying, uh, there is within the unikernel virtual machine a single address space shared between the application and the kernel with absolutely no no protection uh, in between. So uh, everything runs with full privilege. Everything runs in supervisor mode um, on, on the CPU. And, and the reason why there is no need for user kernel protection is that because there is only a single application, right? You know, one of the goals of the kernel on a traditional machine is to isolate different applications from each other, right? You don't want your let's say web browser that could be hacked to be able, able to access the memory of uh, your password manager. Uh, but there is no need for such a thing in a unikernel because you only have one application. So there is no protection within the unikernel, but of course, if you run multiple unikernels, the hypervisor is taking care of isolating unikernels from, from each other, right? Um, so yeah. So it, it's a form of lightweight virtualization. Um, you may have heard of containers. It's another form of uh, lightweight virtualization. And people very often um, compare unikernels to containers. And I, I say a few words about that. Uh, it's, uh, so it leads to uh, a reduction in the attack surface because you, you simply you run less software compared to traditional virtual machines. Obviously, it has some cost advantages. You lower the memory and disk uh, usage. 
uh, of the of the system software at least uh, and um so one of the benefits compared to containers is that uh because in camels are virtual machines they are considered um, more more secure to um, versus containers uh, so so I, I don't want to go too much into the details but because the uh, containers there is it's, there's a very big interface between the containers and the trusted operating system that is ensuring the isolation between containers uh, in in a, in a container deployment. Uh, in a unikernel deployment, you have uh, you know, a very small interface between the unikernel and the hypervisor. And this, in terms of probabilities, it actually it, it translates into more security. Um, so each unikernel instance has um, an operating system layer, a kernel that is tailored towards the application it is running, right? Because it is only running a single application. You can do things like removing all the parts of the kernel that are not needed for this particular application. So in practice, you know, this is done uh, by construction by the compiler. When you when you compile and link the, the, the kernel and the application. Uh, but also you can have a specialized subsystem. Say you can select the memory allocator that will uh, best fit a particular application. You can select a model of the scheduler that will best fit a particular application. So you can uh, also specialize for performance uh, and, and for, me, for resource consumption. Um, and then uh, you, you also get increased performance for certain types of application. Um, so, as I said earlier, the application and the kernel both run with full privileges. And this has a, a consequence is that system calls are actually function calls. So they are much, much, much faster. Like the system call latency is uh, almost negligible, uh, you know, compared to like hundreds of cycles in traditional operating system because you have, um, you know, when you have a system call, you have an interruption, and then you have a page table switch, uh, you have a flush of the TLD. So this is very costly compared to, um, you know, in, in a kernel, you just do a traditional function call. So some system intensive application really benefit from uh, from this kind of optimization. Uh, and also they boot uh, very, very fast uh, in the order of tens of milliseconds. So this is uh, very interesting in some scenario where you, you need to uh, be very elastic and, and react very quickly to some events. Um, so on this slide, I put uh, the name of a bunch of projects. Uh, it's a non-exhaustive list, and um, they are actually much more. This maybe, uh, at least I know that in this slide, you, you have the most famous one, but uh, there, there are many others out there. Um, so, so, so one way to classify the existing unikernel models is to look at uh, what is the language they support. So you know, if you want to run applications with these unikernels and these applications, in what languages can they be written? Um, so the, the first generation of unikernels actually focused on uh, memory safe languages. So the, one of the first unikernels was Mirage and it was supporting application written in OCaml. You have others uh, supporting existing Erlang or Haskell code. Uh, uh, you also have um, unikernels more tailored towards legacy languages that generally provide some form of POSIX API compliance, uh, something like OSV. Uh, OSV is one, one of the most famous ones. You can link a traditional C or C++ application, or even actually more, more, more languages than that. Um, you have others that focus more on, uh, let's say, more recent uh, languages like Rust and Go. Uh, and, and you have also some unikernels that will run applications independently of the language that have been written. So actually, as we should rather be in that category. Uh, and, and this is what, what I'm going to talk about uh, in, uh, in the next, next section of these slides. Um, 
So, okay, so just, just to summarize uh, this introduction to the kernels, uh, so they lower cost by being more lightweight than traditional virtual machine. They have increased security because they have a low attack surface, uh, a strong level of isolation compared to containers, and they get some performance boost in some scenarios. And um, because of that, there are many, many application domains. Like, you know, of course, cloud applications, things like server, uh, serverless computing today, microservices, but also because they are lightweight, things like IoT and embedded virtualization, um, and, and more. Uh, so there have been instances of people using init kernels in NFP, high performance computing, some security uh, applications too, and so on. And uh, so, so, so let me jump to the first contribution, which concerns compatibility. So, um, so, so I've given you this introduction and I've made a lot of advertisement for the kernels, right? There are plenty of benefits to bring, plenty of possible application domains. They are very popular in academia. So these are some of the big Unikernels papers and there, there are many more. Uh, but, you know, today we are like more than 10 years since the Unikernel term was invented. There are many, many projects. And one question is why nearly nobody is using them uh, in, in the industry, right? And one, um, so, so when I when I did this work, which was, uh, it was in 29, 2019, uh, I, uh, one, one clear uh, explanation was that it's very hard to port existing applications to to Unikernel. Um, so just to illustrate that, let me let me show you how you um, build and run an application as a with a Unikernel. Uh, so so you need the sources of your application. You need the sources of uh, the libraries that are the, that your application depends on, uh, and then you need the sources of the Unikernel itself. Uh, you compile all of this and you link that into a single uh, binary, and then you can run it on top of Xen or KVM. Now, there are many scenarios in which this is uh, complicated or impossible. So first of all, if you have proprietary software, you just have a binary, you don't have a source code. Well, you're screwed. You, you won't be able to run this in um, most of the kernel models uh, today. Uh, so you have problems about incompatible languages. So say you want to run your application on top of Mirage that uh, is written mainly in OCaml and supports only running OCaml stuff. If your application is written in C++, well, it's just not going to work. Um, one of the biggest issues, uh, even if you have access to the source code of your application, is uh, unsupported features. So um, if you have, uh, if your application requires some particular features uh, from the operating system that are not implemented uh, in the Unikernels kernels you, you want to, to have a look at, uh, then uh, you, you have a problem. So you end up uh, either porting your application not to require these features, um, or you end up porting the Unikernel kernel itself to implement these features. And, and, and both of these, is, and, and generally, it's kind of a mix of, of, to my experience, you do a mix of both. Uh, and it's very difficult because it requires expert knowledge about both the application and, and the kernel. And it's not really sustainable, right? Because you, you, you don't want to maintain a branch of your application that is specific to the kernel. Uh, and then like the, the cherry on top of the cake is that uh, most unikernels have very complex build to chain. Uh, you know, you have layers and layers of make files, uh, automation, and things like that. And it's, it's quite difficult if your application itself has a complex build to chain, it's quite difficult to kind of merge both. So, um, so um, the solution to that, at least one solution to that problem that we, we proposed was a uh, unikernel that uh, basically requires absolutely zero effort from the application programmer to run his application as a unikernel. And it's a unikernel that is binary compatible with a Linux application. 
So, so what binary compatible means is that in the kernel can take uh, an application that have been compiled for a popular operating system, Linux, uh, and, and run it as a Linux kernel um, without recompiling, without requiring access to the source code, uh, just, you know, take the binary and execute. And um, originally we developed it for x86-64 and, and later we, we ported it to, to ARM64. Um, and Hermit talks like the name is a, uh, so we, we stuck together uh, Hermit Core, which is the name of the unikernel we used as a basis for Hermit talks and, and Linux. Uh, because of the compatibility with Linux application. So uh, the objective is then to run as unique kernels executables that have been compiled for Linux. Uh, so we consider unmodified binaries that can be built with various compilers from various source languages. So essentially they can be stripped or obfuscated. We do not assume access to the application source code, that's a goal. Uh, we want to consider all types of binary, so obviously dynamically linked binaries, but also static binaries. There's a non-negligible amount of static binaries uh, around. Um, and, and, and also something very important is that we want to maintain the unique kernel principles and benefits. So we still want to have a single address space VM. We still want to be lightweight. We still want to be secure. We still want to have fast system calls and so on. Um, so how do you achieve such a binary compatibility? Uh, well, you need to develop an operating system that understands the way uh, applications and uh, request services from the Linux kernel and the way applications execute with, with the Linux kernel. And this is defined as a convention, which is called the application binary interface. It's a set of rules that a program needs to follow to execute on top of Linux. And, and we need to implement the operating system side uh, of these rules within our Unicam. Um, what are these rules? Uh, they are partially architecture specific and uh, I divide these rules into two main sets. Uh, you have the load time and the runtime conventions. So the load time conventions say, okay, so the application should have a format that is supported, this is ELF that describes how the file that constitutes the binary is organized um, uh, at, at load time we also need to know so what is a part of the address space that is accessible for the application so with linux you have the lower half of the 48 bits of virtual address space that is available to most uh, 64-bit processor today uh, the kernel accessing the, uh, sorry, the, the kernel reserving the uh, upper half for itself. Huh? Uh, and then at load time, uh, the application expects the stack to have a particular layout, you know, with things like the command line arguments, the environment variables and so on. Um, and it expects also some registers to hold some particular values. Uh, when uh, the program entry point is, uh, starts to execute. So these are the load time conventions. And the runtime conventions is, you know, how does the application request services from the operating system? So how the system calls are invoked by the application? Uh, but you also have additional communication channels with the kernel. Uh, you may know this virtual file system slash sys slash proc that offer some nodes to control the kernel, uh, the kernel from, from user space. And you also have some shared memory areas in, in, the, in the address space. Um, so this is a layout of the stack uh, at um, when the application starts. I don't want to go into too much details because it doesn't really matter. You probably know that uh, the command line arguments, the number of command line arguments, so all of this is on the stack, should be in a very specific format. Uh, um, so for system calls, uh, the way an application does a system call is uh, it's putting the system call identifier. So each system call has an identifier, like one for read, two for write, and so on. Um, so putting it into a register, Rx, uh, so for, for Intel x 64 uh, the parameters are passed in order into a series of uh, six 
registers, I mean, up to six registers, according to how much parameters you have in the syscalls. And when the syscall is finished, uh, the kernel will pass the return value uh, in the RX register. So once uh, the application is ready to make a syscall, once RX and uh, the parameters registers have been uh, filled with uh, proper values, this is invoked with the syscall instructions that will trigger a trap to the kernel and the kernel will manage the syscall. Uh, so all this stuff we implemented in Hermitax to be uh, to emulate uh, the, the Linux ABI within a small unicam. Uh, now, how does it work from a very high level point of view? So we have a custom uh, hypervisor that is using KVM to create a, a single address space virtual machine. Um, in this virtual machine, uh, it's going to load the application ELF binary um, alongside uh, a minimal kernel that we have developed. Uh, and at runtime, sorry, yeah, the, the kernel is going to craft a stack, set the register according to the Linux ABI I described, and then jump to the entry point of the, of the application. And at runtime, the application is going to trigger system calls um, using the convention I previously defined. And we have a handler in, uh, in our kernel that is intercepting the system calls and, and managing them emulating Linux behavior. And we have some nice tools for debugging and profiling. Um, so uh, obviously we do not support uh, like the entire Linux ABI that has 350 plus system calls. So Hermitax is more like a proof of concept. Uh, still we support uh, around 100 system calls uh that uh give us support for thing for like uh, statically and dynamically compiled binaries multi-threading signals we are scheduling pro priorities so one cool thing is uh, because we are able to locate the kernel uh in a, at a very low address that is not used by the application we have um the entire almost the entire address space available for the application so um you know, it's a nice security feature to randomize the memory mappings uh, and map, and we get much more entropy uh, because of all that space that is available because we, we don't have Linux anymore in uh, half of the address space. Uh, we get much more entropy than vanilla Linux or even the Linux with security patches. Huh? Um, these are the syscalls we support, so I'm not gonna go into all the uh, with a list of all system calls, but we have support for file system, some memory and process management, we have networking, some basic support for signals, scheduling time management, and so on. Um, so, so what about the unikernel benefits? So um, uh, I've described a small operating system that can run a Linux application. So we have, you know, isolation because it's a virtual machine. We have security because it's small, uh, low memory and disk footprint because it's small too. We boot fast, that's great. But um, what about the other unikernel benefits? So we do lose the fast system calls because now we are doing, again, uh, a slow system call based on an interrupt. And we also, because we don't compile the application and the kernel together, we lose this um, modularity of the kernel that would include just what's needed by the application. So to bring this back, um, so regarding the slow syscalls, you know, if you decompile an application and you look at how syscall is done, you'll see uh, things like you know moving the syscall identifier into the RX register. So this is Paul seven, uh, and then you get syscall. So this is an interrupt, uh, and this is a slow system call. Um, so for dynamically load uh, compiled programs, so we have a custom libc that uh, will load into the address space and uh, the, um, the program will dynamically link against it. So, you know, most of the system calls are made by the libc, right? So we have a custom libc that uh, has been modified to not to make traditional syscalls, but just to make fast function calls directly into the kernel. Um, 
So we obtain it by automatically transforming the, the muscle libc um, using coccinel. No, no need to get into the details. Um, and um, for static binaries, it's a bit more complicated. So we need to do uh, binary rewriting. Uh, the problem with binary rewriting is that the Cisco instructions that we want to replace with a function call is very small. It's two bytes, and there is no way we can override this with a, with a jump. Uh, any jump instruction will require more space, and we, we the rewriting will overlap on the next instructions. So we do rewrite and we overlap. Uh, we we rewrite with a jump to a, to a, to a bit of a, a snippet of code that you have here, in which we do a bit of bootkeeping because um, function call and the system call ABI are a bit different. Then we do a function call to the system call in question. And then you see we replay, uh, sorry, we um, we jump back uh, and then we replay, uh, yes, no, sorry. So you see here we overwritten the, the move here. So we replay it as part of the, of the snippet of code and then we jump back. So this is not very clean. We need to analyze the function, the, sorry, the, the, the control flow graph of the machine code to make sure we are not breaking stuff, but uh, we, we made it work on a few applications. Uh, just to note that some people have come up with much smarter solutions <laughs> since then. So you can check out this too, um, especially null polling from ATC this year, which is uh, much smarter in my opinion, but it works. Uh, so just a, a few numbers. So this is a system called latency, uh, measured with an bench three on some relatively old processor. So you still have the uh, kernel patch table isolation that makes Linux very, very uh, slow compared to Hermitux. So this is Hermitux with traditional system calls. So you still have an interrupt. Uh, it's still much faster than Linux for various reasons, like the absence of KPTI and a much simpler system call handler. Uh, with binary rewriting, we are, we are able to cut uh, this latency down by, uh, I would say, uh, approximately half, maybe even more. And, and with the custom libc for dynamically compiled uh, programs, this is just like a pure function call and it's uh, it's super, uh, really super fast. Um, so so an, an, another uh, thing is the, um, the modularity. The fact with traditional unikernel, you know, you, you have access to the source of your application and you compile it with the kernel. So you, by construction, the compiler only includes what's needed for this app. We lose this with uh, Hermitax because the application and the kernel are, are compiled separately. So we use a binary analysis to find out what are the system calls that are made for an application. So this is a bit of uh, an application that has been decompiled. Uh, there is a syscall here, and we see that what is in RAX, uh, which identifies the syscall that is done, comes from R13 and R13 contains 14. And this is a syscall identifier, sorry, 0x14 for write v. So this is a write v system call. So using this analysis, we are able to infer what are the syscalls made by an application, and then we can compile a custom version of Fermi tax for that application. Um, and according to this application, this can lead to a reduction of the kernel code segment that is non-negligible. Um, more numbers, I think um, I, I'm, I'm going to go quickly just to, because I want to say just a few words about the second contribution, but uh, we have a very small uh, disk footprint. Uh, we boot very fast compared to competitors, traditional virtual machines. So keep in mind, these are log scales. Uh, we have a relatively small memory footprint. Uh, uh, this is uh, for x86 and RAM64. Um, we try different type of binaries compiled with different compilers. We enable some obfuscation. Uh, we had a look at different programming languages, Fortran, C, C++, Python. Uh, we had a look at, so these are um, storage intensive application. So these are all in the paper you can check. So we also have Redis. Uh, 
uh, which is the network and application, and we do support multi threading. So these are some uh, OpenMP uh, open apps. And uh, I wanted to do a demo, but I think I'm running out of time. So um, I, I, I just keep the demo and I, I just say a few words, just to give you the time. I'll give maybe 10 minutes uh, on, on FlexOS to give some time for, for questions. Um, so, so, so FlexOS is also a, a specialized operating system, but it is more tailored toward uh, security. And it's a much more recent work. So this is from uh, 2022 uh, last year. Um, so we we started by looking at the different isolation strategies of different model of operating systems, you know, like the monolithic kernel, the micro kernel, the unikernel school. Uh, and basically all the important decisions like the isolation granularity, which mechanism is used to enforce isolation, how data is shared, all of this is completely fixed at design time. So when, when you pick, an operating system for a project, you are committing uh, to a certain performance and a certain level of security, and it's going to be very hard to switch to something else later. You know, if you want a monolithic kernel, you're going to kind of get a middle ground between performance and security. If you want more security, maybe you want to get a micro kernel, but then you're slower. And if you are ready to drop all security, maybe you can use a unique kernel. Um, and, and it'll be a bit faster, right? So this is not suitable in many scenarios, right? You, you have applications that have very heterogeneous needs in terms of security and performance, and you don't have one operating system that is good for, uh, for, for, for all use cases. Uh, the applications, uh, they are made of multiple components with various level of trust that would require being isolated from each other. Um, you have machines with various isolation mechanisms. There's a lot of new technologies uh, underway, things like no cherry capabilities, probably you heard about it. Um, you have all these uh, SGX and confidential VMs coming, coming up. Huh? And then you have hardware protection that break, right? If you get meltdown uh, on Linux, uh, basically you have your user and kernel space, uh, the separation is not secure anymore. And there is no fallback solution to that problem. So this is not ideal. And FlexOS, the idea is that it's a single operating system that kind of gives you access to, rather than a point in that design space, more like an area. Uh, so it's a library operating system that can specialize for security. So at build time, you can say, I want something that is more like a monolithic kernel. Or I want to drop all protection and get unique kernel um, style. Uh, performance and security. So how do we achieve that? So we decouple from the OS design uh, important uh, security decisions. And at real time, we can select um, which software components go into which compartment, you know, as opposed to a traditional like user kernel uh, separation in a, in, a, in a monolithic OS. With FlexOS, you can be much more fine grained. Um, and you can select how data will be shared for communication between these compartments. So you have one application and, 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 and the kernel, and you can very easily, through a configuration file, define various compartmentalization strategies. Uh, in these compartments, you can apply things like flat pointer, address sanitizer, on a per compartment fashion. So this is, you know, like software, we call it software hardening. Um, the isolation between compartments can be achieved with various isolation mechanisms. So currently we have support for Intel memory protection keys and extended patch table, which is, you know, each compartment runs within its own virtual machine. Uh, we are currently porting uh, the cherry capability to be uh, one of the mechanisms supported too. Um, so how do we enable that? Um, so there is a porting cost you need to port your application to the system. Uh, we have a very simple compartmentalization API that requires you to, to do two things, to mark the, um, uh, the boundaries between compartments, um, compartment interfaces with some annotations, and to mark data that is shared between multiple compartments. Um, 
And then at build time, we use this annotation to perform extensive code transformation to instantiate a particular configuration. Uh, more precisely, so say you have this bit of user code, it's calling uh, a function from the uh, TCP IP stack. And we would like to have the possibility to have the user code and the TCP stack to be in different compartments. So the process of porting consists in indicating that RSV is actually a boundary between the user code and LWIP, the TCP IP stack. And the fact that buffer that is passed, you know, it's uh, allocated in user code and it's passed to the TCP IP stack that is probably going to access it. So with an attribute, we mark it as shell. And our tool chain at, uh, at compile time, if we decide that uh, the application and the TCP stack should be in separate compartments, our, uh, our tool chain will instantiate the gate with uh, whatever mechanism we want to enforce uh, isolation, say MPK uh, gate, um, uh, and we'll put a buffer into a shared memory area. But also we can decide that no, these, uh, the TCP IP stack and the application should go to a similar into the same compartment. And uh, in that case, our tool chain will replace thing with just a normal allocation and normal function call. Um, so just to show you an example, uh, so I'm going to show you uh, the throughput of Redis. It's a key value store, a uh, small database with 80 configurations of FlexOS uh, in which we isolate compartment with MPK. We vary the number of compartments, the distribution of software components, so the TCP IP stack, the user code, and so on into the compartments. Um, and we apply some software ordering. I believe it's an address sanitizer on a per compartment fashion. So this is from the paper. Um, so, so on the y-axis, you get uh, the throughput of Redis. And at the bottom here, you see the different software that compose our application. Uh, so it's a library operating system. It's very similar to a unikernel. So you know you have like uh, things like the scheduler and the TCP IP stacks that are all compiled together with, uh, with the application. So we have Redis, which is the, the code of Redis the standard scene library, new lib, the scheduler, and the TCP IP stack. And the color that you see in the boxes uh, indicates which compartments uh, the software components are, are put in. For example, here, if I take this, uh, this, this, sorry, this configuration, we have two compartments, white and blue. If we take this one, we have three compartments, white, red and blue. So here, for example, we have a single compartment that is white. And, and the dots that can be either black or transparent indicates do we enable software hardening or not. Okay, so we generate 80 configuration with variations of uh, you know all these possibilities. And we can see that we get like a very uh, wide trade-off space in terms of performance, right? We have at most more than a million requests per second. Uh, and, uh, you know, it goes down to uh, about 300K. Uh, generally, you can see that, you know, the more security feature we apply, the slower it gets, uh, which which kind of makes sense uh, and, and so on, right? So I, I don't have time to go into the details. There is a bit more interpretation in the paper, but it's just to give you an idea of how big this trade of space uh, is. It is unlocked uh, by, by FlexOS. Um, so we also have a nice design space exploration strategy that I don't want to get into because there is no time. I, I just conclude. Uh, so everything is open source. You can try both Hermitux and FlexOS on, on your computer today. Uh, I put the, um, uh, the URLs in these slides. Uh, so the papers, so this is the original Hermitux paper and we did a air quote extension in IEEE-TC later. It's not really an extension because it gives us only 12 pages in, uh, in IEEE-TC, but it describes uh, the port to the ARM architecture and more experiments. Uh, for FlexOS, uh, we have an Asplos and OS uh, paper. And just to note, so this is, uh, the, the key player in FlexOS is Hugo Lefebvre, he's my PhD student. Uh, 
check out the, his website if, you, if you're interested. Uh, so he has been doing all the hard work for FlexOS. And yeah, that's it. So please don't hesitate to get in touch if you have any questions or uh, ideas for our collaboration. You have my email on the slide. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it would be great if people in Zoom uh, want to ask questions uh, and if you do, maybe just say your name and your affiliation. Um, that would be great. Are there questions in this room? So whilst people on Zoom are thinking of great questions, um, so the, do I understand you correctly that the Flex OS is their support targeting the cherry architecture with that? Sorry, say again. Could, could you hold the, the microphone very close to your mouth because otherwise it's very difficult to hear? I forgot to press the button, so there we are. So, um, is there support for the cherry architecture from FlexOS? Yeah, uh, so, so we are in the process of um, of porting it, and um, it turns out it's much more difficult than expected. So, in, in the um, as plus paper, we uh, just speculate that it should be a piece of cake to port uh, FlexOS to uh, to Cherry, and it's much more difficult than that. Um, the main reason for that is that our assumption that you can abstract maybe a, a many isolation mechanism behind this simple API that I showed, you know, in which you just indicate gates and shared data, uh, it doesn't work with Sherry. Uh, with Sherry, you have something else that you need to do is uh, because, you know, all shared data needs to be transformed into capability. Not only you need to change the type of shared data, but you need to change a lot of code when this data is accessed. Uh, and this does, uh, you know, more, more stuff is needed uh, because we don't do anything about that data accesses in FlexOS. Uh, we have been trying to automate that through a compiler pass, but we, I admit we do lack uh, compiler expertise in my team. We, we are never able to, to make it work. So we are, for now, we are kind of porting things manually, you know, doing all these modifications of the code manually. And, and because of that, we are restricted to functions that are not too big, isolating just functions uh, and things that are not too big. It's a bit... Uh, uh, it's a bit unfortunate, but uh, I think it's, it's also like it comes from the design of Cherry's uh, uh, the, the way they manage compartmentalization in Cherry. It's not not ideal, and then possibly the lack of compiler support too. Thank you very much. So just to repeat myself now with the microphone that works. Um, if even on Zoom wants to ask questions, just say your name and your affiliation. I can see the a raised hand at Glasgow. Thanks, Rob. Jeremy Singer here. Um, I'd like to ask Pierre about the uh, the annotations um, which uh, developers would make to identify compartments and uh, shared buffers and so on. Um, two questions. Number one, is there any feedback from developers as to how helpful or uh, kind of um, uh, workable these annotations are? And question two is, um, is it possible to kind of break the code if you do the annotations incorrectly? Thanks. Um, so, hmm. I, I guess if, if you look at uh, most of the related works, I think in, in that line of work, annotations are acceptable. Um, it's considered it's very difficult to fully automate without any hint from the programmer. Uh, now, uh, concretely, I don't think any of the modern compartmentalization frameworks, including FlexOS, is used anywhere in the field, right? Um, we, we did a big study, and the only example of compartmentalized software running in production, they have been compartmentalized fully manually, okay? Uh, Things like you know SSH, Chrome. So this stuff have been not only designed from scratch with compartmentalization in mind, but done by experts with a lot of knowledge about the application in particular. Uh, 
you know, a key issue today is how do you retrofit compartmentalization in existing software? And you cannot assume that you, you will have full knowledge about all the applications you want to compartmentalize. So um, fully automating that seems very difficult. So it is agreed, uh, at least, you know, given the state of the art that annotations are okay, or obviously it depends on the amount of annotation. And for the second question, can you break things with uh, wrong annotations? Uh, yes, of course. If you uh, forget to mark uh, a data as shared, it will be considered as private. So it will fault at one time when a compartment tries to access it and it doesn't have the right. Uh, you will also screw up the security of your system. If you mark a data as shared, then it shouldn't be. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> It is a flow of um, of annotations. Thanks. Well, the questions, yes, the question will get some two-minute microphone there. Hi, this is Anna from the University. I just want to do this thing here. So I'm very curious about how or what your thoughts are about uh, your solution compared to the custom execution environments, Intel FDX, PDX, ARM, ARB, and so on. How would you uh, or what are your thoughts on comparing your solution to the custom execution environment? Uh, so, so, sorry, can you repeat? Because the sound quality is so bad, I, I didn't get it. Uh, Okay. Okay. So, is it better now? Um, it's a. I think it's a. It's a mic problem. But, uh, I'll manage to this one. Is it? Is it? Is it now better? Ah, uh, this is better. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So, yeah, I'm Sama from TU Preston, and I was curious about your thoughts about uh, your solution compared and contrasted to trusted execution environments. Intel FTX, PDX, ARM, AMD, and so on. Yeah. You compare and contrast, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Okay, so, so, so the, the, the trust model is actually similar. To me, uh, trusted execution environments are a form of compartmentalization. Um, the technology that we use in Flex OS will not um, provide confidentiality. Okay, we do not encrypt. There is no memory encryption. It's always Cherry or uh, or MPK, but but the trust model is the same. You see, so the trust model is uh, from at least in the general case, you place yourself from the point of view of a compartment. You don't trust anything else in your system. Okay, and it's exactly the same thing as an enclave. You don't trust uh, you don't trust the kernel. That is that, that you are calling that is returning stuff. So in compartmentalization, it's exactly the same. When you, I mean, in the general case, once again, um, mm -hmm. each compartment doesn't trust uh, what data it is fed and uh, what data is, um, uh, you know, it doesn't trust anything from that time. Now you have some special cases that are actually not uh, not that special that are sandboxing and safe boxing. So if you sandbox something in your application, you don't trust that piece of code, but you trust the rest of the application, right? The rest of the application, let's say you sandbox a third party library because you don't really trust the persons that have written this code. From the point of view of the rest of the application, you don't trust uh, this, safe, this sandbox. From the sandbox, you do trust the rest of the application, right? So it's a different threat model. Uh, that this one is different from uh, from confidential, uh, sorry, uh, from T's, right? In T's, like the, the, the compartment, the enclave doesn't trust the operating system and the operating system doesn't trust the, the enclave either, right? Yeah. And then you have a third uh, compartmentalization scenario that is the safe box in which say you want to protect a, a critical piece of software that is manipulating like crypto keys. So, this critical piece of software doesn't trust the outside of the code and the outside of the code trust the uh, piece of software. So yeah, I would say, you know, to summarize, it, it's a matter of trust model. 
And in the general case, with compartmentalization, it is similar to uh, T's. Yeah, but, but still, you don't, don't provide confidentiality, right? Uh, that's yes. part of in the terms of uh, yeah. Right. In terms of encryption, we do not, but we, we do very similar things uh, apart from confidentiality. Because of the trust model, we need to do very similar things. For example, uh, you need to, as a compartment, if you don't trust the rest of the world, you need to vet all your inputs, right? So if another compartment is calling you, or if you are calling another compartment, you need to sanitize all the data that comes through your interface because you could be fed or return the bad pointer. You need to check it before the reference it. Maybe you need to do data copies if you are executing concurrently with the other compartment because it may change this data uh, even after you you um, uh, you checked it. So you have a very similar uh, trust model, and the way you design your system um, is is very similar to Enclave. Think about each compartment as being its own Enclave, basically. Right. Thank you. Thanks. There was a question from Glasgow, or maybe not. Is there? You are muted, so we, we can. You're muted. Hi, uh, I think you kind of answered the question. So I wanted to ask you to just comment on the threat model. So my understanding of, of a trusted execution environment is that. Uh, first of all, uh, let's talk about the trusted code base. So usually the operating system is outside the TCV in a trusted execution environment, right? Uh, so what is the TCB, uh, so what is the TCB in this case, in case of compartment-based thing? What would the TCB include? So it, each co each compartment is its own TCB, basically. But you uh, do okay, so uh, yeah, uh, so what it, in in FlexOS in particular. Uh, there is, yeah, there is a TCB, and uh, let me try. So it is, it is detailed in the paper, right? But we trust uh, things like the scheduler not to mess up the register upon so context switch. We trust the interrupt management system, I believe. We trust uh, the memory management. So we have a relatively small TCB. So we use the unikernel once again as a basis for our system. So the, the TCB is very, very small, right? Like the operating system is probably about 10,000 lines of code, something like that. Uh, and, and most of it is not trusted, right? Mm. Uh, but we, yes, yes, we, we do have a small TCB uh, in, in, in the system, um, of course. And, and contrary to, to T's, uh, it, it contains kernel components. Yes. So can there be like availability attacks, which is like, uh, say we trust the scheduler. So can I like starve a process, like a compartment never gets scheduled, that kind of attacks? Uh, yeah, we didn't have a look at uh, things like performance isolation. So in theory, uh, yeah, you could. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you so much. Yeah, just a comment on, uh, or a follow up on that question, just to clarify. Uh, it's not always the case that you your OS is outside the TCB. So there are two ways of um, making the TVs. It's one way is uh, process based, which is this SEX, Intel SEX kind of thing. Uh, and the other way is the um, VM based trusted execution environments where you actually trust the whole OS inside. So it's not always correct to Say that the OS is outside the TCB. It depends on which implementation is for Intel SCX. Yeah, yes. but, but I think by, by OS you mean host, right? Like the host OS is outside of the TCB, even with a confidential VM, right? Ah, okay, 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 right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was referring to the host OS, yeah. Yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's end with one final question in the chat from Hardeep. Do you want to read the question in the chat box if you can find that? Uh, so the question is, you commented on Unikernels not having much uptake in industry previously due to build issues. Uh, you've shown how binaries from more widely used operating system can be used. Have you seen this be used by industry or do you think it will be taken up? So I can tell you, so, so today the most, uh, the Unikernels that seems to be uh, the most promising is Unicraft. You may have heard of Unicraft. It's a, it's a startup from Germany. Um, 
And I'm, I'm actually actively working with them and they have acknowledged the fact that if they want to gain traction, uh, they need to be compatible with a good number of key applications. So uh, their uh, you know, kind of adoption strategy is driven by compatibility and they are basically doing the exact same stuff as their networks uh, being binary compatible. Because once again, you know, it is not sustainable to ask a developer to maintain a special branch of their application for, for your operating system. I mean, uh, okay, if you give them 10x performance, of course, they will do that, like with DPDK or some stuff like that. It has been seen. But the unikernels are not going to bring 10x performance or 10x security, right? So you, you can't ask too much uh, from the application program. Uh, it is still early to say if Unicraft will be successful or not. Um, my take on that is if, Uni if Unicraft is not successful, it probably be the end of Unicraft because after uh, that much time and you know not much uh, uh, uptake, I, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm a bit pessimistic if Unicraft doesn't make it. But that being said, Unicraft they are. It's the first time that people are actually paid uh, to work and, and to build the unikernel, right? All the other stuff is like academia prototype. So me, you see, Hermitux, I didn't commit to Hermitux since uh, 2020 because I just have other stuff to do. I cannot do, uh, you know, maintenance because I'm, I'm, an, I'm an academic. But uh, Unicraft is a startup. You have people paid to work on it. So hopefully they will succeed. Great. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it's an unusual setup we've had, but it seems to have worked well. There, there, oh, there is another question. Maybe yeah. you want to come to the front. Sorry, no, the question is about the command. Um, some people might be interested in the demo that was in Yeah, so. Maybe it goes formally and invite people from the demo who can't see that. Sounds like a good idea. So I, I want to formally thank you. And then the suggestion in the room is that demo demo that you had, maybe now after the uh, after the thanks, you can give a demo for people who want to stay and watch that demo. Oh, yeah, sure. So it's not very long. Okay, well, it was an unusual setup. It works well. Um, and thank you very much for giving an interesting talk. So thanks again from the room and from people in the in the Zoom uh, in the Zoom call.